everyone, it's Katrina. Number 10. Amenhotep I's Missing Tomb Amenhotep I was the second ruler of Egypt's 18th dynasty. He came into power in 1526 BC and ruled as the pharaoh until 1506 BC. He was never supposed to inherit the throne because he had two older brothers. But both of them must have died because Amenhotep took the throne from his father and ruled for over 20 years. We know that his father conducted military conquests to the south, conquering the kingdom of Nubia, but little is known about Amenhotep because his time is king wasn't documented very well. The one thing Amenhotep is remembered for is that he separated his tomb from his mortuary temple. Instead of being buried inside the temple dedicated to him, he had a totally separate tomb. This would become the normal thing to do, influencing the mortuary trends of Egypt's new kingdom. There are a few other known facts about Amenhotep, like that he married his sister and made her his royal wife. He was also nicknamed he who inspires great terror. So he may have been a powerful military leader or a total psycho. He had the Temple of Karnak expanded and likely undertook other large building projects. Today, Amenhotep's own temple, built separately from his tomb, is still standing near Deir el-Bari. And near the crumbling remains of his temple is the burial tomb of his sister and wife, Amos Meritamon. The biggest mystery when it comes to Amenhotep I is that scientists have never been able to find his actual tomb. Its location is unknown and could be anywhere. But in the scientific community, there are two main possibilities. A tomb was discovered high in the Valley of the Kings, empty with no body. And another tomb was found at Dra Abu El Naga that some believe might belong to him. But nobody has ever been able to confirm which one the king was originally buried in. His body was eventually found along with multiple mummies belonging to kings and nobles of the new kingdom and Deir el-Bari. So, for some crazy reason, the pharaoh's corpse was taken from his tomb and stashed with a bunch of other corpses of kings. It had nothing to do with looting because his funerary treasure was still intact, like his cartonage face mask. And to this day, the collection of kingly mummies is one of ancient Egypt's weirdest unsolved mysteries. And now for number 9. But first, it's shout out time! I want to give a big thank you to Brandon Gordon and Breda DeFazio for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about amazing discoveries. Number 9. The Great Quake Something big happened on July 21st, 365 AD, and scientists desperately want to know exactly what transpired because they think it changed the world. Historical accounts across the Mediterranean region speak of devastation on that day. Historians described a crippling earthquake that reduced cities to rubble and killed thousands of people. Those living in coastal regions all the way from the Nile Delta to Dubrovnik in Croatia reported great tsunamis that swallowed and entire cities. By every historical account, it's clear there was a biblical-level destruction event, but scientists have never been able to figure out the original location of the earthquake. The best guess scientists have right now, based primarily on field observations, is that the earthquake happened near the island of Crete. Scientists think the earthquake was so intense, it lifted the western portion of the island 30 feet. The resulting tsunami was big enough to annihilate coastal cities. People living on the Mediterranean's coastlines would have seen a massive wall of water coming at them and probably would have thought the world was ending. Scientists have determined that the earthquake likely had a magnitude of 8.0 or higher. Archaeological excavations in Greece, Africa, and Spain have revealed that coastal cities were destroyed at the exact same time. And to be extremely specific, it happened during the early morning hours of July 21st. When the great quake occurred, Christians believed it was a sign from God. They thought it was his way of showing disapproval at the fact that Emperor Julian was trying to restore paganism to Europe. Historian Libanius even wrote that the earthquake was a sign of divine wrath, and he was hardly the only ancient historian who detailed his opinions of what caused the devastation. Roman historian Ammianus Marcellinus described in great detail how the quake shook the land and how the giant waves swallowed the coast. 
Recent geological studies have revealed portions of the truth. Scientists finally agree Crete was likely the source of the earthquake, but now they also think it was the result of all the major tectonic plate boundaries in the area reactivating. It may have been the largest earthquake in the region's history, at least since humans were around. Number 8. The Gopachal Rock Cut Monuments India's Gopachal rock-cut Jain monuments are magnificent statues near the Gwalior Fort. They were crafted starting in the 7th century AD and continued to be shaped for 800 years. The sheer scale of these monuments is awe-inspiring, as the ancients skillfully carved intricate statues that seem to come to life. They shaped them out of the faces of cliffs, revealing each figure as if they were hidden underneath the rock and only needed to be set free. However, the purpose behind their creation remains a mystery that scientists have yet to unravel. The monuments are some of the best examples of ancient Jain artwork. Jainism, one of the biggest religions in the world, isn't widely known in the West. Its roots go back thousands of years, and there are millions of dedicated followers. The history of Jainism isn't as neatly recorded as the history of Buddhism, but it definitely goes back to around the same time that the Buddha was alive. Followers of the Jain religion displayed a unique affinity for constructing megalithic statues and undertaking grand artistic endeavors. Gwalior Fort has been around since at least the 6th century AD. It's a powerful hill fort sitting atop a rocky crest, which is where the monuments were carved. The fortress and the gigantic statues came into existence around the same time, suggesting they were made by the same people. The monuments themselves are all immaculately carved Tirthankaras. A Tirthankara is seen as a spiritual teacher of the Dharma. There are 24 different spiritual teachers in the Jain religion, and several of them are depicted here at Gopachal. Some are sitting and some are shown standing, but all of them are absolutely enormous, with the tallest of them standing an impressive 47 feet tall. They were obviously made as religious symbols, but the history of those who made them is forgotten. Around the year 1527, Mughal Emperor Babur ordered the total destruction of all Jainism art, and unfortunately, the statues at Gopachal were heavily damaged by this, almost to the point that they were gone forever. Number 7. Indonesian Warships Archaeologists may have just solved one of the biggest mysteries in the world. Inside a cramped and claustrophobic cave, indigenous people in Australia painted pictures of boats. The paintings were found about 50 years ago and have been puzzling scientists ever since. The issue with the watercraft is that they look exactly like ancient Indonesian warships. But how in the world did the indigenous people of Australia paint pictures of warships used by people in Southeast Asia? Archaeologists think they've identified the warships as coming from the Maluku Islands. Indonesia might sound far away, but the Maluku Islands are located directly north of the continent. One of the authors of the study, Daryl Wesley from Flinders University, said the pictures prove Australia was never really on its own. It wasn't completely cut off from all other life for 65 thousand years, Australians had visitors from Asia who came on fighting vessels. They didn't draw sailing ships or merchant vessels in the caves, but warships specifically. This suggests there was violent conflict between the people of Australia and the seafaring Indonesians. Scientists still don't really know what to make of the discovery. Although they've known about the pictures for decades, nobody's really taken an interest in them until now. Maritime archaeologist Mick de Reuter says the voyages to Australia from Indonesia may have been accidental, happening alongside regular fishing trips for sea cucumber. And not only does the discovery of warships change Australia's history, but it also changes the history of the Malukans of the Maluku Islands. They likely weren't peaceful fishermen as previously believed, because if they had ships for fighting, they may have been naval conquerors. But this was 500 years ago, before any European had stepped foot on Australian soil. So who really knows what happened? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Number 6. The Kingdom of Yam very little is known about the ancient African kingdom of Yam. The few bits of information available come from Egyptian texts written during the Old Kingdom. One of the clues as to the whereabouts of the kingdom of Yam comes from the tomb of a man named Harkuf. 
He was the governor of Upper Egypt sometime between 2345 BC and 2181 BC, serving under both pharaohs Merenre and Pepi II. The inscription in his tomb says that he made an expedition into a land called Yam, which was located somewhere to the south. The expedition lasted seven months, and the governor brought back great gifts to Egypt, and he received praise. The inscription in his tomb says he went forth upon the Elephantine Road, bringing gifts the people of Yam had never seen before. And upon his third expedition to Yam, Harkouf learned that their chief had plans to smite the people of Temei, but he convinced them to be peaceful and went back to Egypt with even more treasure. There's one other vague mention of the kingdom, but that's pretty much it, and modern scholars have no idea who the people of Yam were. The only thing anybody knows is that they must have been within a four-month walk of Egypt, but you can get pretty far walking for four months in just about any direction. Another big mystery scientists can't explain is the mention of the Elephantine Road. The governor was describing routes that people likely knew about 4,300 years ago, but today they've lost all meaning. Scholars are divided over where Yam was. Some believe it was somewhere in Lower Nubia, while others think it could have been as far west as Chad. Unfortunately, though, there's no good answer as to why there is no other mention of their presumably powerful empire. Number 5 the Gears of the Gods In Peru, archaeologists discovered a series of strange bronze artifacts that look like mechanical gears. These so-called gears are a huge mystery and seem to point to a lost technology scientists have never found. Some call them out-of-place artifacts, but others say the gears were used as simple decorative items, disc-shaped totems treasured by ancient people who revered the sun. The biggest issue is that nobody knows where the gears are today or who even found them in the first place. They were first mentioned by Professor Rafael Largo Hoyle in an obscure book he wrote about Peruvian archaeology in the 20th century. There is a black and white photograph of six gears, which look like mechanical components or like artifacts of sun worship, depending on who you ask. But the physical gears are gone, lost to history. It isn't impossible to imagine an ancient culture in Peru figured out how to make a machine out of gears. After all, the Antikythera mechanism has 37 different types of gears, the biggest of which is approximately 17.3 inches and originally had 200 and 23 tiny teeth on it. The device is a complex clockwork machine that was created around 2,200 years ago by Greek scientists. And if the Greeks could do it, there is no reason why an Andean culture couldn't build a similar machine. Unfortunately, though, all anyone has are theories because the artifacts are gone. One of the most popular theories is that the bronze gears were used to operate the doorway of the Amaru Meru, also called the Gate of the Gods. Amaru Meru is what looks like a door carved into the side of a mountain near Lake Titicaca in Peru. Local legend says the door was once used by ancient gods who came to Earth thousands of years ago. The door was operated by an Incan priest who opened the portal using a sacred golden disc as a key. So, maybe the bronze gears were replicas of the key, or copies of it. Then again, maybe they were used in a primitive clockwork machine that has since been destroyed. But what do you think is the truth here? Were these gears decorations, mechanisms, or keys? Let me know in the comments below, and while you're at it, be sure to subscribe. Number 4. Archime Archime has been called the Stonehenge of Russia and is one of the country's most mysterious archaeological ruins. It was built around 4,000 years ago as a fortified settlement, and it may have housed up to 2,500 people. The dwellings were modest, built from earth and organic material, but they had fireplaces, cellars, and furnaces from melting ore into a usable product. Each circular dwelling was positioned at the edge of a paved street, and the streets were lined with gutters for collecting rainwater it was an intensely sophisticated stronghold, and in its center was a rectangular courtyard, likely used in festivals and ceremonies. But who in the world built this place? The best guess archaeologists have is that the stronghold was constructed by Proto-Indo-Iranians, or perhaps by the Sintashta culture, who dominated large chunks of the Eurasian steppe. The design of the settlement itself is an object of mystery. Some scholars have suggested the builders designed their city as a model of the universe. 
Just like how Stonehenge was likely used for astronomical observations, so too was Archi made in a way to observe the sky. Experts say that 18 cosmic phenomena can be tracked by using the layout of the town. Objects in the heavens would have run along paths indicated by the layout of the settlement's streets and buildings. But then again, it might just be a coincidence. Archim was first seen by aerial cartographers in the Russian wasteland in 1952. It wasn't properly discovered by archaeologists until 1987. There are over 20 other similar structures that can be found throughout the region to the north of Kazakhstan, and each one is designed in an almost identical pattern. Archaeologists call the area the Land of Towns because it's an abandoned landscape full of ruined cities and strongholds whose builders have been gone for thousands of years. Today, almost nothing remains of Archim itself, just a small ruin and the imprint of where the settlement's high walls once stood. Number 3. Where are the noses? If you've ever strolled through the Egyptian section of a museum, you may have noticed how almost all the statues are missing their noses. If you haven't gotten the chance, you've probably noticed it in pictures, and the Sphinx doesn't even have a nose. It might not seem that unusual that the monuments are broken after thousands of years, but a lot of them are missing their noses. Specifically, even the nose of the Great Sphinx at the Pyramid of Giza is missing its nose. So what happened? For a long time, archaeologists assumed noses broke from statues because they were more frail than other parts. They stuck out from the rest of the face, making them easy to break off. But even on flat reliefs and wall carvings, the noses are purposely smashed. Ancient Egyptian figures from the 25th century BC until 2,000 years ago are mostly missing their noses. But why is that? Archaeologists can't say for certain, but they do have a reliable theory. Ancient Egyptians believed every time a statue was made of a person, it was given its own life force. Even if a person died, their life force was still alive inside pictures of them or in stone monuments. And if somebody wanted to remove that life force, a good way to do it would have been to break off the statue's nose. Ancient Egyptians believed that without the nose, the statue wouldn't be able to breathe, and the life force inside of it would suffocate. Adela Oppenheim, curator of the Egyptian department at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, says the Egyptians understood science. They weren't so ignorant that they thought statues would get up and start walking around. They also understood these statues couldn't breathe air to sustain themselves. But at the same time, they believed the life force was hiding somewhere in the statue. Egyptians also believed that their own life force came from the very air they breathed. They didn't fully understand blood and brains and the more complex details of the human life support system but they knew it had to do with breathing air. The Egyptians also performed rituals in which they'd pour blessed oils over the mouth of a statue as a way to give it life and power. They knew the statue wouldn't get up, but the oil could help maintain the life force trapped inside. Damaging the nose might not have snuffed out the life force, but it couldn't hurt to try. When tomb raiders went down into the dark and creepy depths of burial chambers, they often feared the person they were robbing might take revenge. So, to stop them, the tomb raiders likely smashed the noses of their paintings and statues. Number 2. The Menga Dolmen the Antequera archaeological site in Spain dates back almost 6,000 years. The site itself is covered in cave paintings, rock shelters, and prehistoric dolmens, or megalithic tombs. The area once formed a sacred space for the mysterious Neolithic communities who lived here, and long after people had already come to the region, the Menga Dolmen was built. The Menga Dolmen is a megalithic burial mound that was constructed around 3650 BC. It's a whopping 90 feet long, making it one of the biggest ancient megalithic structures in Europe. In total, the dolmen is made up of 32 mega blocks of stone. Picture the massive stones that make up Stonehenge, but imagine they are arranged in such a way to be used as a tomb. The roof was sealed by earth and massive slabs of rock, and some of these stone columns weigh roughly 200 tons. So it's no surprise that scientists are puzzled over how Neolithic humans managed to move 32 of them and why they went through so much trouble. There is a central path leading into the stone structure. Typically, the path is oriented toward the sunrise and most other megalithic constructs like this one, but not here. Instead, the monument is orientated slightly to the north during the summer solstice, 
pointing straight at a small cave in the side of a distant mountain. When archaeologists excavated the dolmen in the 19th century, they uncovered the skeletons of several hundred people, suggesting that it was once used as a mass grave. But why? And what happened to all the people before they were buried inside the enormous dolmen? The weirder thing nobody understands, though, is why the entrance is pointed straight at a random cave on the other side of what's now a highway. Number 1. Who was Queen Kubaba? A tavern keeper became the ruler of one of the largest civilizations in the world 4,500 years ago in Mesopotamia. Her name was Kubaba, but archaeologists aren't sure if she was a real person or a mythical hero. Her name was found on the Sumerian king list, but the list can be a little tricky to understand since it chronicles the rulers of Mesopotamia, but frequently throws in the names of gods and legendary figures. There are the names of ordinary men who ruled over Sumer, like Alulim, Hadanish, and Zizi. But then there's also mention of Enmen Luana, who ruled for 43,000 years, if the list is to be accepted as factual. The list itself is one of the strangest artifacts from Mesopotamia, and researchers are puzzled by it because it does include real monarchs. However, it also includes the names of gods who ruled for tens of thousands of years. The Sumerian king list has been interpreted by many conspiracy theorists as proof that Sumer was home to living gods, specifically the Anunnaki. Kubaba herself had an extremely impressive reign as queen. She supposedly sat on the throne of ancient Sumer for 100 years, and in a time when life expectancy wasn't quite what it is today, 100 years of being queen is an impressive feat. There isn't much else known about Kubaba. The list simply says she was a tavern keeper who became queen. Not queen regent either, meaning she wasn't a mistress who sat next to a powerful man. The list describes her as an official ruler. She's the only female on the list whose title was queen and not queen consort. How do you think Queen Kubaba rose from tavern keeper to ruler? Assuming she existed at all, let me know what you think in the comments below. Thanks for watching! Be sure to subscribe and give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. See you next time! Bye!